Hey folks, BFG Neil here and it's time for another weekly news roundup of what's happening on the Helium Network. At the end of this video I'll go over your questions from last week so remember if you want a question answered please drop a comment below and I'll get to it in next week's video. As a quick note, thanks for your support. I'm nearing a thousand subscribers now so if you're enjoying this content please consider liking and subscribing. Okay, let's get started with the news. In what's been a huge week for news, the first story I want to cover is Light Gateways. Helium did an AMA a couple of days ago, and for those that didn't see it, Rawman has uploaded it to his Hopspot podcast channel. Um, so you can listen in, check out some of the finer details, and hear some of the questions that were asked around Light Gateways. Um, on the back of that, two HIPs have been launched and voted on. There's HIP 54 and HIP 55. Now, HIP 55 improves um, the way gateways run, right? So a hotspot will no longer sync, the bandwidth usage will go down, um, and what happens is the validators will do that challenge. It does mean moving a very small portion of funds, so 0.9% is all we lose. So we still beacon, we still witness, everything still happens as normal, but challenger rewards, which accounts for 0.9% of total HNT rewards, will be moved to validators. Now, what this will mean is that consistency of earnings will return to hotspots. Often, POC fails and it fails silently, so you won't even notice that it's failing. Um, the last figures, it's different per manufacturer, but the last figures I saw were around 30 to 40% of POC fails. So, enabling this and enabling validators and having light gateways will mean consistency of earnings. And you'll stop having problems like the zero witness problem, um, dropping out from sync, and the overall usage of, of your miners drops, so it's a really welcome hit. But please don't be scared by it. Obviously, a lot of people joining have been saying along the lines of it's another um, dropping earnings from what hotspots can make. You know, when validators went live, they took 6% away from um, hotspots no longer performing consensus. But what happened is we stopped having halts, we stopped having problems, we stopped having slow block time. All of this increased earnings and the same thing will happen here. It's a very, very small portion of rewards, so please don't be scared by it. This will really improve the network and see us grow to huge numbers of hotspots and the network succeed. Without this hit, we will see problems on the network. We may see the return of more halts. Um, it may mean that the POC reward rate is lowered even further. And it's very important that we think about the future. Validators and light gateways have been planned for the longest of times. Uh, it's over a year now, so it's very important that we see this move forward. It's clear that this is the way that the network is going to grow and scale to a larger size. So please don't be put off this hit. One further comment that I want to make that often is said to me, I am not a validator. I am not in the validator reward pools. If you would like to join the validator reward pools, you can, you can partial stake. So you get the same rate as they do if you put one HNT into partial staking as if they put 10,000 in themselves. So there's no difference. Remember validators are people too, and you can join them if you want to, to secure the future of the network. The second hit that's up for vote is HIT54, and that is H3 DEX based POC targeting. Now these hits always come with very difficult names, so I'm gonna lay this down in English. The problem is at the moment is certain areas, if they have a lot of offline hotspots, they are targeted more often to beacon than areas that don't have these offline hotspots. It's not a bug, but it's just the way the system was designed, and HIT54 changes that. So when these economic changes and these targeting changes happen, they have to happen in a, in a hit. Personally, I think this is more of a bug, but it's very important that we're open and everything goes for a vote going forward. That's one thing Capcom said recently, every change will go for a vote. So those are the two active hips that are voted on at the moment. Um, they're both positive impacts to hotspots. Hit 55 comes with a very small 0.9% reduction in rewards for hotspots, but overall the consistency of earnings comes back and HIT54 means that offline hotspots do not count towards targeting, so we'll see a much better spread of beacons and a much more regularity return to beacons. And just to finalise everything for you, um, this is Amir, CEO of Helium's response to why we need HIT55. These are the reasons why you should vote yes. No more hotspot syncing, no more snapshot issues, no more relay, no more relay challenges, no more port forwarding or firewall problems, no more SD card issues. Data consumption will be a fraction of what it is today. Hotspots will come cheaper due to hardware requirements. And the only reason not to vote no is that we lose 0.9% of earnings. So what it's saying here is that SD cards won't fail because they won't be written as much. Data transfer goes down to a fraction of what it is today because they don't sync the chain anymore. 
um, snapshot issues and syncing issues and filling the disk issues go away. Relay goes away. It doesn't matter if you have no incoming port. You know, hotspots just check in. So it means that we're going to have a much better situation for hotspots. So please vote for these hips and please vote yes. Okay, and the next bit of news I want to go over is that the redenomination hit 39. They've decided to move it to August to focus on core priorities. Core priorities in this case is getting the light gateway software out there. When HIP39 was being developed beyond the vote, um, it, was, it was found that there is an opportunity for gamers to hack. So there are certain chain variables that need to exist and there is a, there's a clear path that needs to be taken. Otherwise, if, if the swap happened from one coin to a thousand, there is a very brief window where they could sell their coins for, for an insane profit and it's just not healthy for the network. So the changes are much more complex than they thought, much lengthier than they thought. Um, so they've decided to move to August. Just so everyone's clear, there are also a, a couple of hips in works at the moment. Um, hit 51, hit 52, hit 53. And hit 51, 52 and 53 are talking about DAOs and sub -DAOs, So layers to this chain, you know, the main helium chain and then the protocols running on top of it. 5G, um, LoRaWAN, it could be Wi-Fi 6, it could be point-to-point -point Wi Fi anything these these can all exist on top you know think of it like ethereum ethereum's the base coin helium's our base coin but these sub protocols are like erc20 tokens so they can exist on the network but everything settles in hnt and everything is used in dc so what these hips will allow us to do is to do this redenomination on a different level so when the if these hips go through um, they will reward what's called wireless network token. So these wireless network tokens can be a thousand larger. Um, so there, there's calls to say, do we need HIP39 still? Will it happen? But what's clear is that if anything happens, it will always be done under a vote. Please don't think it's not going to happen. It's more of a question of what layer does it happen on and when is it going to happen? Next piece of news is now Explorer shows if you are on the deny list. So there's a big red warning here that shows if you're on the deny list. Um, this is a very useful ease of life feature. So being able to see straight away if there's a problem with your hotspot. Obviously this method will eventually get replaced with hit 40 and hit 40 shows a way that um, you'll be shown what list you're on and that you're blocked and every transaction would actually return to you. So at the moment, the deny list means that the challenger will drop witness receipts from a hotspot that's on the deny list. With hit 40, um, the activity still happens and you would see it in your list with an invalid reason of deny. Um, and it'll also show you this great, great image of what list you're on so you can find out more information. Just as another note on deny list, um, I saw a post on Twitter the other day that was saying another project that's um, in a crypto field um, put a deny list in place and banned a thousand users. Now, just to show you how popular the, the network is, I've copied the raw deny list. So this is available for anyone to see and you can also put in issues if you find yourself on the deny list, you know, both removals and additions for hotspots that you find. So if you want to see this list, you can just go to the Helium deny list in the GitHub and there is a deny list file. Um, at the moment, it's so big that you can't view it. You have to view it raw. So what I've done for you is I've copied it into a spreadsheet. And as you can see, there is 40,484 records. So gaming is being stopped. It is being targeted. The main source of entries on this list is actually farming, industrial grade gaming, where they were just putting the hotspots in the same room. So don't feel like just because the one hotspot or your hotspot is you know a few yards off that you're going to end up on this list. Don't game. Don't edit meter data and you will not end up on this list. And the last news story that we have today is the future of hotspot apps and wallets in the Helium ecosystem. Now Helium published an article on their blog and they've been talking about it for a while, but makers are gonna get their own hotspot apps. So the, the, the main Helium app is now going to be a wallet. And if you have a rack, you would get a rack app. If you have a sense cap, you would get a sense cap app. Now, what would happen is that if you want to send a transaction from that app, it actually passes you through to the wallet. You, you know, you perform your security and then you send your funds. So the, the apps for makers will be basically about managing and maintaining your hotspots. And what this allows them to do is build much better apps that are focused specifically on their hardware and their software to help you improve your setups. So the blog post goes through everything. 
shows you some examples of the wallets, um, which is going to include some great features like a contact list. Finally, I can save all of my hosts in a list and just send them money, which makes it much easier. The, the next one that's really nice is that we're going to have 24 word wallets. Not that 12 words are bad, just that 24 words are twice as secure, right? So I would prefer 24 word wallets. And there's also some great improvements such as multi-account access. So if you have more than one wallet, you can manage it. You can manage testnet access, multi-payment features, and more. In relation to some of the questions answers about this, they have, there is a great FAQ section on this, you know, will makers be required to have their own apps? And yes, but what, what Helium is saying is that they wouldn't just leave them in the dark. They, they would still work under the app until the day they are ready. There are also some teams building some fun pieces of software around this, but it's not my place to say it. Maybe if they're ready to say it, they can come on here and we, we can have a talk about it. I'd be very happy to do that. Okay, and now it's time to go over your FAQ questions from last week's video. Remember, if you want your question answered, please feel free to drop it in the comments below and I will go over it next week. First question this week comes from Stephen and he asks, when will a hit be approved to allow 5G hotspots to earn POC, HNT? Now there are a couple of um, steps to this that have changed recently. Um, the one thing to talk about is that there is now HIT53, a 5G sub-DAO. So the, there are talks of, of how everything's going to move on the chain, how things are going to be changing in the future. But I think the most important thing with 5G is that they earn from the data, right? We're not chasing areas that have no device usage. We're chasing high traffic areas that do have phones in the area. Um, and there's some news coming soon about an MNO, one of the biggest providers. You know, there's only three in the States. One of those is signing up and very close to a deal. So it's much more important that we talk about data than we do POC. And in regards to 5G data, the best thing I can show you is the timeline on the FreedomFi website. This will be linked in the, in the description below, so feel free to check it out afterwards. But it says that the first 5G data on testnet will happen in April and the first 5G data on mainnet will happen in May. So this is a huge improvement because at the moment um, you can sign up and use these 5G cells, but you have to buy an eSIM package and it's sort of a test account, right? It's not fully on chain yet. So we'll start seeing those developments soon. And then once the 5G DAO stuff is settled down, then we start to see, um, you know, things like POC for 5G coming through. The next FAQ question comes from a friend of mine, Night Ninja, and he asks, if you tighten up the antenna too far on a rack, is it true that the wires can cross if the lug turns, which affects the antenna? Wondering if this is the issue on a few. Um, the nut on the back of the hotspot inside is, is really tight. You know, you can't really overturn it. I have heard of some people doing it. You know, whenever you do up an antenna connection, it's really important that you only do it hand tight, right, for this reason. So what happens is you put your antenna cable into a port, that port then has an internal wire that connects to the LoRa card, right? So if you turn it too much, you can twist. Um, it's it's not, not really possible, but you can on some makes. You can twist that cable and break it. I've seen that happen a few times. So when you put an antenna in, just make sure it's hand tight and you should be fine. If you do need to replace that cable, it's just an IPEX cable, they call it, or UFL sometimes, and just make sure you get the right end. So most modern hotspots nowadays use RPSMA. So you can search for IPEX RPSMA and find a replacement cable. Next question comes from Jacob and he says, could I share any news or knowledge about spoofing on the network and how he was planning to address it? He personally has a Pisces spoofing farm in his country, was off to one side, but now they've moved into the town center and it's affecting people's transmit scales and beacons and coverage. So the first thing to say is that the deny list is in place now. It has 48,000 hotspots on it. If you believe someone should be on that list, you can submit an addition request to this list. So you can put these hotspots down and the reason why you think they should be there. Um, the first thing I say is make sure you, you know that they are and they should be on there. There's some basic checks you can do um, you know, are they only witness in their own wallets? Are they unbelievable RSSIs? Are the RSSIs all the same? And, you know, what I suggest to, to do is to bring the conversation into the POC discussion room on Discord, where people can help you um, work out if they are gaming and how badly they are gaming. And even if, you're, if, you've never done, if you've never done anything on Git before and you don't know how to do a, an addition request, they'll help you through that process. Next question comes from Dennis and he says on the next video, could you elaborate on what is testnet? So testnet is just a very small copy of what the chain does. Um, they use a token called TNT, testnet token. 
and it just allows them to test changes while not breaking anything on live, right? So most times in systems like this, you will have a test net. From what I understand, the test net is actually being opened up so you can run test net like gateways. Um, you could do it very easily with hardware. I've done it before in the past, Pi, Laura Hat, or you know, go out and get yourself like something like a Dragino LPS08. So these will never run from POC, but we will allow you to test on the test net just to see how things work and how things are gonna be improved. Up next, we got a question from Creed Rock and Roll, and he says the subdial stuff is a little hard to follow. Will Laura Miners be earning the subdial token, or will they be earning the main HNT? And, and he also mentions the exchange rate one for one. So the first thing I wanted to point out was that the one for one isn't a thing. Um, there's what's called a bonding curve to it. So representative of how many tokens you get, you would get HNT in return. But hotspots will earn this wireless network protocol, but they won't be sold on the open market, right? So when they want to cash out, they would burn. The wireless network token into HNT, and the bonding curve tells you what rate it is. Now, the bonding curves are really um, complex to explain, so have a look at the hip, have a read through it. But just just know that HNT is still the main form of payments. You may have another token that you have to have an additional step to burn to, to then sell the HNT. But HNT is still the main currency. DC is still the main currency of usage on the network. Up next, we've got two questions from Sky Interceptor Racing. The first question is. Will there be any effect on sectoral antennas at this time or in the future, even if you're providing good coverage? Um, and the quick and easy answer to that is no. The chain does not know the difference between a sectoral antenna and an omnidirectional antenna, so you're absolutely fine to use both. And the second question is, is that Helium says that height is not taken into account when you put the height status in the app, but will this be considered in the future and will this affect um, earnings? If you're untruthful about it, will you have d diminished earnings? The quick and easy answer to that is no, height is not used in any transactions and at this time there are currently no plans for it to be used. Um, all height allows you to do is for me to look at your hotspot and say, well, how high is it off the ground? And if I put a hotspot here, um, how high would I have to go to get line of sight to your hotspot? So that's all the field's used for. I'm not saying it won't be used in the future, but there are no current plans for it to be used in the future. Up next is a question from Andy G and he asks, how come when I beacon I get one witness if the challenger is relayed. Surely if the challenger is relayed I should get zero witnesses. The quick and easy answer here is that um, relay doesn't always cause problems, right? So it's only on um, certain occasions where the relay link dies that it will reset and you'll start seeing issues. And yes, often the uh, challengers won't hear the witness receipts, but they do make it through sometimes. So you will have these times where beacons are absolutely fine even if the challenger is relayed. Up next is a question from Bunky and he says, thanks for another great video. You're welcome, bud. Um, but will our hotspots convert automatically to light or are light hotspots being manufactured and therefore need to be purchased? So yes, the plan is hotspots, full hotspots, convert to the light gateway software automatically. So you're not required to go out and get any more hardware. I like to think of it as full hotspots being the Ferraris, right? And we're just driving them at 30 miles an hour. There is extra headroom and that headroom can be handy. Um, so don't worry about needing light hotspots. There'll be no major differences. So there's no reason for you to buy new hardware. And the final FAQ questions of the week come from Stuart, and he has a three-part question. The first one is, is that um, he has a friend with a hotspot that's turned up in his hex, and he wants to put one in, and he's wondering if the denialist hotspot will affect the transmit scale of his friend's hotspots. So due to the way the denialist works at the moment, the odd bit of POC will get through, so it will affect transmit scale. But what you often find with these denialist hotspots is they go offline very quickly, so you'll find that um, the transmit scale should jump straight back up. The second part to his question is, is uh, why don't they just remove these hotspots that are on the denial list? Surely it makes sense to remove them completely. What you have to remember is this is blockchain, right? So once you add something to the block, you can't remove it. So we could hide these hotspots. Um, just remember if they're offline for 2.5 days, they're, con they're not considered interactive. So they don't affect transmit scales. They won't affect your rewards in an area. But what could happen in the future is maybe that they're hidden from Explorer if they've been offline for a certain time. I'm a big fan of this. I believe if a hotspot hasn't been on for a few months, then it should be hidden from Explorer to make it look better for the area. And if they do come back online, they just pop up online straight away. And the third part of the question is, is if I bought a second hand hotspot and it's on the deny list, is there any way to come off of it? Yeah, just pop over to the GitHub where Helium have the deny list. Please feel free to talk to anyone on the, the, the Helium Discord and they'll show you how to do this. But you can request removals. One thing I will note with this is it's really, really good idea to get your hotspot in a shot, show the cable, 
maybe show a, a location on your phone with you know your GPS coordinates. A paper of today always helps as well. And just show that you're in the area and that you're running a legitimate um, hotspot and that you purchased it off eBay from a scrupulous uh, provider and it has now been fixed and put that request in you know the more information you give the more feedback you give the more likely you are to be removed off the deny list if you just go on there and say i don't agree with the deny list please remove my hotspot it's not going to come off so as much information as you can if you do buy one of these hotspots please put it in the ticket the the issue and um someone gets when someone gets around to it which is normally every few weeks um, you'll be removed from the deny list. And that's it for another week's video. Thanks again for joining me. And remember, like and subscribe if you enjoyed this content. It really helps with the YouTube algorithm. Bye for now.